In true American style, I'm British, but in true American style, I'm going to begin with two, two disclaimers, not one, but two. Um, so firstly, everything I say today is my view rather than the view of the Lowy Institute, which very thankfully for me gives us all independence to say whatever we like and then disclaims itself from our crazy opinions. Um, and secondly, I want to make clear to everyone here today that I'm not a political scientist, an economist, or a pollster. So there's a real risk that some of the predictions I give you today may actually turn out to be true. <laughs> so got that out of the way. Let's get on to, to the meat of it, Hong Kong, which I know uh, many people are interested in and want to know more about. Let's see if this thing works. OK, there we go. So I'm sure everyone here has seen many images like this over the last four months as Hong Kong has really been consumed by this rolling political crisis, a huge protest movement, million person marches on two if not three occasions, violent clashes between police and democracy protesters, democracy protesters and triads, vandalism, vigilantism, you know, really dramatic images that managed to keep um, your president out of the news on some, some occasions, which is quite, quite amazing. Um, and I'm not actually going to talk too much right now about these sorts of scenes, because I want to take you a little deeper and try and explain how we got here, because I think it's really important to understand that if we're to have a sense of what's driving the movement now and maybe where we're headed, although, again, my predictions may be wrong completely. So while watching all these images and talking to friends in Hong Kong, one big question was on my mind, which was, why are people, and young people in particular, but Hong Kong is in general, willing to risk so much to fight for democracy in their city? Because make no mistake about it, taking on the Communist Party of China, especially at the moment, is not a cost-free exercise. So we've seen people on the streets beaten, shot, stabbed, an Indonesian journalist was blinded by a supposedly non-lethal round fired by the police. 2,000 people have been arrested, more than 2,000 people. Hundreds of people have been charged. Many of them are likely to go to jail for years. Careers have been destroyed as a sort of white terror has uh, taken place in the corporate sector with companies pressured to sack people who support the democracy movement. So people are paying a really high price. And that's not an easy thing to do. So I've been wondering why. And if you ask the Hong Kong government, or you listen to what the Chinese government says, or the Chinese state and Communist Party controlled media, they'll say, this is all a bunch of thugs. This is a mob. Or in the words of Carrie Lam, Hong Kong's chief executive, um, you know, these are people with no stake in society. Well, I don't think the evidence quite supports that. And I'll give you a good example. So last week, um, Hong Kong saw the biggest single day trial it's seen since the handover from British control in 1997. And 97 people, democracy protesters, were on trial for rioting and other offenses in connection with their role in the protests. Now, I want to tell you about who these people were, because I think it really gives you a good sense of who they actually are rather than who the government says they are. So of the 97, about half were students, high school, to university, the youngest being 14. Um, but among the rest, the adults, there was a really wide range of occupations. So I'll read some of them out to you. We had a doctor, a teacher, a teaching assistant, a social worker, a fashion designer, a cook, a laborer, and my favorite, a Lego salesman. So <laughs> this is a really diverse bunch of people who've been charged with rioting, um, who are engaged in a really broad protest movement with many different facets. And one question as well as why people are risking so much is what binds this diverse group of people together across ages, classes, um, income brackets, even if they are, I think, being led by young people in particular. Well, many analysts have really argued that what's at the root of what we're seeing in Hong Kong is the socioeconomic problems the city faces. It has the highest house prices in the world uh, as a proportion of median income. Graduate salaries haven't increased substantially for many years, people live in tiny flats, et cetera, apartments. Um, and of course, those are real and concerning problems. But as people who live in DC, or Sydney, where I live now, or London, where I'm from, Taipei, Tokyo, San Francisco, will all tell you, these are not unique problems, right? So I don't think, to my mind, that fully explains what's going on in Hong Kong. 
I think the next point, which is really important too, is the political pressure that Hong Kong has been facing from the Communist Party, which I'll go into in a bit more depth later. That's also really important. But I'm going to argue today that the glue that binds together all these people around certain issues is a sense of resurgent Hong Kong identity, which is being both threatened and at the same time reinforced by Beijing's pressures on Hong Kong's freedoms and autonomy, which were meant to be guaranteed for 50 years from 1997 onwards. And it's important to understand that this uprising, that's what I think it is, is not in fact an isolated example of resistance, but it's part of a deeper drive by Hong Kongers to defend their city, their way of life, their freedoms, which are unique within China. And I guess if there's two things I want you to take away today, um, it's one, it's really hard living in the shadow of a rising authoritarian superpower, as Hong Kongers are finding. And secondly, I guess a bit of a plea to, you, you guys are obviously already interested in Hong Kong, but I think we should focus on it a bit more as something of a canary in the coal mine to try and understand what happens when the values and the way of doing business employed by the Chinese Communist Party come slap bang against the sort of liberal democratic values that many people in this room, I'm sure, uphold, as do many people in Hong Kong, although probably not everyone in the city and certainly not everyone in Hong Kong either. So what's my connection to Hong Kong? I've lived and worked most of my adult life in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, Vietnam and Singapore, and China always loomed large in the background of these places as I did my work as a correspondent for the Financial Times. And in 2015, I moved to Hong Kong to start work as the South China correspondent for the FT. And I had really bad timing. Um, this is why. So I arrived just at the fag end of the Umbrella Revolution, the Occupy movement, when hundreds of thousands of people had occupied the streets of Hong Kong, pushing for the right to democratically elect their leader, known fittingly given Hong Kong's sort of corporate nature as the chief executive. And they failed. Uh, there were many people on the streets. Uh, there was a lot of high spirits. But Beijing, of course, didn't bow down in the face of this kind of mostly um, nonviolent civil disobedience. And at the end of the movement, when people were clearing up the last few stragglers and tents, etc., quite a few young people put up these posters saying, we'll be back. And I think at the time, it looked extremely hubristic. Um, you know, this was an amazing movement, an amazing coming together of people, but it had failed. And in truth, if you spoke to activists at the time, they said, this will never happen again. Hong Kongers are intrinsically focused on business and money. They don't care about politics. They like winners. They don't like losers. So that was our moment. We tried and we failed, and that's it. But of course, five, year late, five years later, here we are. People are back, and they're stronger, and more united, and more violent in some senses and more smart in other senses too. So how did we get here? I think, I'll argue today, this is a drama in three acts. The first act being Beijing's squeeze on Hong Kong, mostly over the last 10 years, but you can perhaps predate it um, slightly earlier. Secondly, a backlash led mostly, but not exclusively, by young people in Hong Kong. And thirdly, the denouement, which is the unprecedented political crisis we're seeing on the streets of Hong Kong today. So firstly, the squeeze. So I like to think of Hong Kong as the world's most ambitious real-time political science experiment. The hypothesis is, can a free city survive inside the world's most powerful authoritarian state? And the answer today looks pretty much like no. Um, but luckily for you, I have a bit more to say than that. So, one Country, Two Systems, which is, as I'm sure you all know, the arrangement by which Hong Kong is governed, was always a messy compromise between the British government and the Chinese government to get through this sort of very strange period as the lease for Hong Kong Island and Kowloon um, expired in 1997. And by the way, the Hong Kong people were never consulted. That's, that's an important point. But it was a compromise between the British government and the Chinese government. Um, and at first, the compromise worked quite well. And that was partly because, I think, China was much weaker at the time. The communist leadership was still following Deng Xiaoping's maxim to hide your strength and bide your time. But obviously, that changed dramatically over the last five to 10 years. I think it's something that probably predated the rise of Xi Jinping um, to power in 2012. But I think it's almost certainly intensified, it definitely has, uh, since he came to power and in the last 
few years. So to give you an example of some of the real pressures that Hong Kong has been facing, I'll list some of the sort of in incursions into their freedom and autonomy in the last three or four years. So we've seen agents for, for Beijing kidnap, uh, abduct people off the streets of Hong Kong and remove them into secret custody in the mainland. Um, we've seen elected lawmakers in Hong Kong's partially democratic legislature ousted. Young activists have been banned from standing for office based on what is effectively thought crimes. Um, we've seen a political party banned outright for the first time since 1997. And another lovely first, Hong Kong expelled its first foreign correspondent um, last year, well, actually my former boss at the FT, a guy called Victor Mallet. And I think for many Hong Kongers and certain people outside, they see these as signs of what they call mainlandization, that Hong Kong is starting to look more and more like any other mainland city. It's actually still unique in many ways too, but the pressure is real on the freedoms. And also importantly, Hong Kongers were promised a high degree of autonomy, and that's also under great pressure. So Carrie Lam over the summer spoke to a small group of business people in what she thought was an off the record setting and admitted she basically has no room for maneuver dealing with the protests today. Beijing calls all the shots and someone then leaked the comments to Reuters. So we have it direct from, from the horse's mouth, but it's not just the freedoms, but the autonomy that's under great pressure. Now the squeeze has prompted a big backlash, as I said earlier, and that has definitely been led by young Hong Kongers. And to demonstrate that, I wanna talk about three large and very closely linked social movements that I think um, you know, explain the issue. And the first two got us to the third one, which is where we are today. So everyone's heard of Occupy in 2014 and the Umbrella Revolution, as it was known, after the umbrellas people used to fend off um, police pepper spray back in the days when tear gas and pepper spray was all you had to worry about, not being shot or attacked by triads. But not many people have heard of scholarism, which is really quite an important movement. This was in 2012. Um, and this was a protest led by teenagers against an effort by the Hong Kong government under pressure from Beijing to bring in what they called patriotic education into the Hong Kong school curriculum, which was basically a curriculum to promote a better understanding and sympathy of the Communist Party of China and its rule over China, and in some senses also denigrating the liberal democratic values that many Hong Kongers hold dear. And when this proposal came in, young people revolted. Um, they staged their first class boycotts and occupations, led by people like the guy on the, my far right, which is Joshua Wong, who some of you may have heard of. Next to him is Agnes Chow. Um, and this was a really significant movement for a number of reasons. Firstly, it succeeded. So after this pressure, the government dropped the proposals. Secondly, I think for many young people, it was their first time they'd got involved in politics. They put down the manga comics and the computer games and you know, started to get involved in fighting for their values. And I think the third factor that's important is because the Communist Party and the Hong Kong government had framed this as patriotic education, um, they're basically, it's an example of how they're trying to take ownership of the Chinese identity. And this, I think, showed a lot of people that they weren't just rejecting a government proposal, but they were, in fact, rejecting the approved, officially approved version of what it means to be Chinese or to be part of the PRC, which Hong Kong is, which I think has really important implications later on. So after this, I think th this was the movement in which these guys were blooded, and I think it definitely helped them come to prominence, and it led to this. The, the Umbrella Revolution of 2014, which was a far more ambitious and large scale movement aimed, as I said earlier, at trying to win democratic elections for Hong Kong. Hundreds of thousands of people took part, not tens of thousands or thousands in the scholarism movement. And many, many young people in Hong Kong who I interviewed um, over the years told me that this was their moment of awakening. Before this, they had said they kind of were in line with the stereotype of Hong Kongers that they only care about trying to get a good job, get a good flat, you know, get on the, the conveyor belt, as it were. But I think this huge gathering of people and the reaction to the day when the police tear gas people um, really drove a lot of people to question their role in the city and make them think they had to stand up and do something. But sadly, this ended in sort of great period of disunity among democracy activists. It ended in bitter infighting, should were we too hard? Should we not have occupied the streets? Should we have been more violent? Should we have let the adults take more charge? Should we have let the kids take more charge? 
Yeah, it was really quite a tough time, and I think it was hard to imagine in the aftermath of Occupy that we would get where we are to today. And before I get on to today's movement, I just want to delve a bit deeper into this question of identity. Personally, I, I'm a historian by training. I've long be fa been fascinated by identity, having studied uh, the history of Southeast Asia and seeing how all these very strong nations emerged out of the randomness of colonialism, the embers of empires. So I was really interested in identity formation. And when I was in Hong Kong, I kind of felt something similar happen. I could feel young people grasping around at some sort of identity as they were rejecting, you know, an authority that they believed to effectively be a colonial master uh, who they didn't choose and they never had any, any decision-making power um, over the people who were going to be in charge. And my book was called Generation HK because I kind of felt the generation of people who came of age after the handover, um, who I think I'd say were like teenagers tw in their 20s and 30s, experienced either their whole life after the handover or at least their whole adult life. I felt they had a much stronger sense of Hong Kong identity than their parents and their grandparents. And they had a really weak connection both to Hong Kong's British colonial legacy and also to mainland China. And one of the ironies of sort of China's standoffish approach in the first few years is these guys never had any reason to feel that Chinese. They felt they were just Hong Kongers. They didn't have anything to do with the PRC. Um, so the Hong Kong identity was there and it was quite strong. But at first, it wasn't necessarily in conflict with Chinese identity. And there was this moment around 2008 during the Beijing Olympics when I think many people in Hong Kong and around the world thought China was going to be opening up, you know, not overnight, but slowly moving in the sort of more, maybe more liberal direction. And that was actually the peak, if you look at the data, of Hong Kong as feeling Chinese. But as the squeeze tightened over the last few years, we've seen kind of a divergence where increasingly, especially for young Hong Kongers, they're completely rejecting their Chinese identity and embracing this kind of unique Hong Kong identity. Now, what is this Hong Kong identity? I spent a lot of time asking people, and it's quite hard to get a clear answer, which is kind of funny, but actually it's quite normal. I mean, if I asked you what it means to be American, how many of you could give me a clear answer in one or two sentences? Um, and the sorts of things people were saying to me, being a Hong Konger, it's about speaking Cantonese, it's about the rule of law, it's about people who love democracy, people who love freedom. And then I started to realize that all these things were facets that marked people out as not being from the mainland. And again, that seemed a bit strange at first sight, but that's actually quite normal because we all define ourselves against others. The Scottish most definitely define themselves against the English, the English against the French, the Canadians, of course, against the Americans. That's why they all put the flag on their backpack, although I've heard these days quite a few Americans are putting the Canadian flag on theirs just in case as they go around the world. So this is quite a normal process of othering and identity formation. But I think, unfortunately, for Hong Kong and for the Communist Party, because I think this is a tragedy on all sides in many senses, you know, they started to squeeze Hong Kong. And they started to squeeze Hong Kongers and their sense of who they are. And um, the more they've done that, the more the pressure has increased, the more this identity has hardened, especially among young people. I want to show you a quick video, if it works. So this, this is just a video of football, or as you would say, soccer fans uh, booing, which seems quite normal, right, any sports match. But this is actually quite unique. This is Hong Kong football fans, Hong Kong soccer fans, and they're booing. They're booing a national anthem, and it's in fact their own national anthem, the Chinese national anthem. And this is something that started in the aftermath of Occupy, as more and more people started to sort of question their Chineseness. And it, there was only a small number of people there, but I think it was a highly symbolic act. And of course, as soon as Beijing realized this was going on, they had a very typical heavy-handed response, which was to force Hong Kong to implement a law against disrespecting the national anthem. It's currently in process, but if and when it's passed, if Hong Kong ever gets back to making laws, um, you'll be liable to three years in jail for disrespecting the national anthem. And as I say, that's quite a typical heavy-handed response, which takes me on to where we are today. And I think the proximate cause of this movement is another heavy-handed effort 
to sort of challenge uh, one of Hong Kong's sort of key facets, which is its independent legal system, which is so important for many Hong Kongers to their rule of law, also to their way of life and the way they see, see themselves, and importantly to Hong Kong's status as a successful global financial center. And the independent legal system came under threat because of this proposal to bring in an extradition bill that would have allowed Hong Kongers, and in fact anyone transiting through Hong Kong to be extradited to the mainland for the first time. And that was really, I think, the trigger that reignited um, all the angst and frustration um, that had been there after Occupy and before Occupy. So I don't see this movement as a new, something new in itself, but I see it as part of this ongoing struggle to protect Hong Kong's political freedoms, to protect Hong Kong's identity. And unfortunately, the heavy-handed response since this whole thing started has also made it much worse. So the crackdowns by the police, the Hong Kong government's unwillingness to engage in any sort of meaningful negotiations or concessions. And I think today's uprising really has its roots in Occupy. Um, one recent survey showed that around half the participants at one of the big protests had been on the streets during Occupy. But it's also really, really different for a number of important reasons, which I'm going to briefly outline. So firstly, um, today's uprising is leaderless, right? Um, and there's a number of reasons why that's the case. I think firstly, there's a positive effort to make it more inclusive, partly because people can have no real say over their government. They wanted to have a movement that allowed people to voice their different opinions and come to some sort of consensus about what to do. I think there's also a deliberate strategy to ensure there are no tall poppies um, to be cut down by the authorities, because one thing that happened since 2015 is that many prominent democracy activists faced criminal charges. Many were jailed, including quite a few people who I interviewed for my book. I want to talk very briefly about one of them, um, this guy. Um, not many people know him. His name is Edward Lung. Um, he's actually a former fellow at Harvard. He was an activist for Hong Kong independence, which is a fringe sport in Hong Kong. Um, but a very interesting guy, and he was jailed for six years for rioting for his part in an anti-government protest in 2016, which sort of started with support for unlicensed street hawkers and ended with violent clashes with the police. And I think in some ways it was a precursor for the sort of clashes that we see today, not on a one-off basis, but multiple times in a week. And Edward Lung's a really interesting guy because while the movement is leaderless, he, if anything, is the spiritual godfather. Because when he was around the time of the right, he was also running in a local by-election in Hong Kong. And he came up with this slogan, which is liberate Hong Kong, revolution of our times. It much, sounds much better in Cantonese. Um, I won't butcher that for you today. Um, so liberate Hong Kong, revolution of our times. And that's become the de facto slogan of the movement heard every day on the streets, in shopping malls. People in the evening shout it from their apartments. You can hear it at pro-Hong Kong protests in the US, in Australia, in Europe. So quite amazing that this guy who's behind bars uh, is somehow the spiritual leader, but there are no leaders. And people didn't want any more Edward Lungs to end up in jail and sort of take the rug from under the movement. Secondly, I think the modus operandi has switched from occupation, which is sort of the tactics of scholarism and the umbrella revolution, to this be water uh, motto, which is it's about being much more unpredictable so that you're not in one place at one time, allowing the police um, to arrest you. And this comes from something Bruce Lee, the legendary Hong Kong martial artist said, which is water can drip and it can crash. Be like water, my friend. Um, and I think that links to the next difference, which is the unity of the movement. So it's been a very conscious effort to ensure that while people have very different tactics to try and reach the goal, all Hong Kongers who want to see Hong Kong be more democratic need to stand together rather than end up in internecine conflicts, as happened after the Umbrella Revolution. And there's another good slogan there people have been talking about, which is climbing the mountain together, making your own effort. And it's really been amazing to see how people who totally disagree about tactics um, can somehow find a way to work together, rather ironically mimicking the United Front strategy. Um, honed by the Communist Party north of the border and practiced in Hong Kong as well for many years. So we've seen so many different things, artists, collectives, school kids doing their own thing. People are borrowing from the international lexicon of protest 
For example, with these human chains, which come from the Baltic Way in 1989 in the Baltic states, then part of the Soviet Union, which was um, you know, this movement to oppose Soviet rule not long before it fell, not saying the same thing is going to happen in Hong Kong. But people are doing different things in their own way and trying not to fight with each other so long as they share the same ultimate goal. Now, one of the challenges for that is the next difference, which is the willingness to use and or condone violence. And that's been a dramatic change in Hong Kong from previous movements. So we've seen people violently clashing with the police, engaging in targeted but quite serious vandalism of government buildings, the metro, which is seen as being close to the government and the Communist Party and other businesses linked to the mainland too. And what's fascinating to me is that many middle class Hong Kongers, many educated Hong Kongers who don't support violence will not condemn it. And what they'll say is the government started this, the police are to blame. And they'll also point out that can, they, can we know who's really behind this? Because there seems to be some evidence of the you know, police dressing as protesters, etc. So it's quite amazing to see you know, people in this developed city who've started to really acquiesce in the face of violence because they feel it's in defense of something they hold dear and they have no, no other weapons. I mean, that links to the fifth key difference, which is the death of trust in the Hong Kong police. And again, surveys show probably about half the people in Hong Kong have no trust in the police. That's because of their heavy-handed tactics, failure to protect people who were attacked by triads on many occasions. Um, so it's really been very damaging for, for Hong Kong. And I think it's hard to see this ever being fixed. And that's a real problem because you know, a successful society needs people to have trust in their law enforcement. People need to believe in the state's right to have a monopoly on the use of violence. And that's really been totally destroyed in Hong Kong. So I think it's fair to say that there's no going back from here. And there is a real risk that we're now entering a spiral into a serious um, long-term conflict. So as I said at the start, over 2,000 people have been arrested. Hundreds have been charged, and many of them are likely to be jailed. And Hong Kong only has a prison population of 8,000 people. So just imagine the, the consequence of adding hundreds of people who half of Hong Kong who support democracy consider are political prisoners to your, your jail system. I mean, it's quite incredible to think about the impact of this in the years to come. Then there's all the people whose careers are going to be destroyed. Because as I said earlier, companies, mainland companies, Hong Kong companies, international companies have come under pressure to sack staff who've engaged in protests, who've made supportive comments on social media, and people have been losing their jobs and careers. One of the people who was charged with rioting and then later sacked was an employee of Hong Kong's main airline, a very well-paying job. You know, he probably will never work again in Hong Kong if, if, if he's convicted. So people are really risking a lot, and I think the city will never be the same again. But I want to try and end on a slightly more positive note, because I think it's been very heavy. It's a bit depressing. Um, so as I showed the, vi the video earlier, a few years ago, people were booing the Chinese national anthem. Not, not everyone, but people were engaging in that activity. And things have moved quite far since then. And recently, during the protests, a group of Hong Kongers came together and actually created their own new anthem through a mix of crowdsourcing the lyrics, involvement of professional musicians who did the scoring. And that kind of underlines the way this movement has worked, right? The unity, the diversity, where different groups of people come together and give what they have in the mission of you know, achieving a wider goal for Hong Kong. So I just want to play you a brief bit of this anthem that works. Yeah, unfortunately the video didn't work, but you, you heard the song. It's basically a sort of, it's, a, it's a dedicated to the people struggling for freedom in Hong Kong and imagining a better Hong Kong. And you can argue about the merits of it, uh, but what's more interesting to me is the fact that people are writing their own anthem. And that's really a sign of people wanting to define their own story, define their own identity. And I've seen it sung in the streets of Sydney when I went to a pro Hong Kong protest there, young people, old people who'd printed out the lyrics and were singing it. 
Um, and I think it's testament to the transnational nature of Hong Kong as a city and, and this movement, and also to kind of the aspirations of the people. And we're really seeing this Hong Kong identity, I think, being forged in the fires of this political struggle. So lastly, I guess, the question I'm sure you all have is, what are the chances of success for the democracy movement in Hong Kong? Of course, in the short to medium term, almost zero, right? And that's not surprising in many ways when they're facing such a powerful adversary. And I think many Hong Kongers who I speak to understand that. They're not naive. They've been living in the shadow of the Communist Party since the foundation of the CCP as China's government, and even before then when the CCP was quite heavily involved in Hong Kong. So they understand what's going on. So why, why are they doing what they're doing? Why are they risking so much? I mean, the best way I can find to explain it is what I call hopeful pessimism. So no one believes that Xi Jinping is going to turn up tomorrow and say, oh, Edward and Joshua, you're right after all. Just have your democracy and celebrate your Hong Kong identity and we can all be friends again. That's obviously not going to happen. But people are desperately trying to keep the flame of resistance and hope alive and hope for some change outside their control that makes things better. And at the end of the day, I think that's just about young people in particular, but now other Hong Kongers who are joining the fight wanting to write the next chapter of their own story rather than let it be defined by anyone else. Thanks.